So that didn't go as planned. A 3-1 loss at this point in the season doesn't doom Barcelona's chances at the La Liga title. It's the same three drop points as last week against Adafe. But it is an emotional letdown that you wonder if the team can recover from. I think the more frustrating aspect is how Barca started and the plans laid out at kickoff compared to the team at the final whistle. Wouldn't anything else, Ronald Koeman looked like a manager with some good ideas who was only second best to Zinedine Zidane after 90 minutes. Before we get to any of the action, let's talk managers. The stage was set for desperation. On the Madrid side of things, Zidane was apparently on the hot seat, though I doubt that, and Koeman will always be on the hot seat with a new board coming in soon that may not want him. But he seems to have security until then, a weird position to be in. Hot seats or not, this was El Clasico with an added bit of urgency. The last matchup between the two, when neither Barca or Real Madrid topped the table, 2007, which ended 3-3. Keep that in mind for later. Here's the point where I admit that Coleman's early bravery shocked me. I knew he was more willing to shake things up than his recent predecessors in Valverde and Setien, but his starting 11 was a bit jaw-dropping. Sergio Roberto was one of the captains, has played in many El Clasicos, and has started all five matches so far this season. Antoine Griezmann had started the four matches prior to sitting against Ferran Varos. These aren't overwhelming indications that Coleman would switch it up, but he opted for Pedri and Dest. The talent might be there, but El Clasico was the biggest test of their careers, and they were given starts. The more incredible thing was actually the positional changes that Coleman opted for. Fati played at the number 9 position for the first time in over a year, back when he was with the Juvenil Oz. To start as a lone striker for the first time in your career in El Clasico? Woof. That meant that Messi was tucked underneath him, pushing Coutinho out to the left and putting Pedri on his less comfortable wing on the right. Behind them sat Busquets and De Jong, then a backline of Alba Lengley, Pique, Dest, and Neto in net. Before we get to what went wrong in this match, let's hit the first two goals. Within the first five minutes, for much of which Barca had the ball, Madrid got out on the counter. A mistake by Sergio Busquets put Karim Benzema free in the middle, who provided the assist to Fede Valverde for the 1-0. Some of his actions in his personal life, especially those related to the French national team, have always made me dislike Benzema. I can appreciate some of the talent in Los Blancos, but I feel like I underrate Benzema because he's one of the players that I don't like for both his jersey and his past. So I was quite surprised to learn that his 6th El Clasico assists now tie him with Guardiola for the most in the last 25 years. That's more than the 5 from Iniesta, Messi, and Mesut Ozil. As annoying as that goal was, I still felt that Barca came out ready to play and they got the equalizer soon after. Messi released Jordi Alba like he's done so many times before, and Alba delivered a terrific square ball which Fati deftly poked past Courtois with a finish that is much harder at the speed than it looks in slow motion. With that goal, Fati became the second youngest goal scorer in El Clasico history and tied the La Liga record for most goals scored by a player under the age of 18. The youngest goal scorer record is still held by Alfonso Navarro, who played for both Barca and Real Madrid and was three days younger than Fati when he scored for La Bagrana in 1947. Fati's goal was also Barca's 400th in El Clasico. He joined Cesar Rodriguez with the 100th, Bern Schuster with the 200th, and Luis Enrique with the 300th, with those centennial goal milestones. And remember when we mentioned 2007? Well, this was the first time since then that there were two goals in the first 10 minutes of El Clasico. It was Ruud van Nistelrooy and Messi back then. Alright, enough of the fun stats, because this is where this match turned back to the frustration of 2020. Unlike every other match this season sans Ferenvaros, when the attacks regularly flowed down the left and through the middle, Barca were in almost perfect harmony against Madrid, leaning a bit on either side, but generally wanting to attack with Messi through the middle or Fadi over the top. As I said before, this pushed Coutinho out wide, a position he hasn't had to play yet this season, and it didn't work. It was Nacho and then Lucas Vasquez at right back for Madrid, two players that the Lograna should have been able to exploit one-on-one, -on -one, but that's not Coutinho's game. It's quite frustrating that getting something out of Coutinho can only happen when he's playing at the number 10 spot, a position that multiple players could play and excel at. Instead, I'm left saying that he put in a good defensive shift. The one time he did get in a dangerous spot was his 54th minute miss on an open header. To me, the turning point before the turning point. To be a bit more positive, the right side of Barca's attack exceeded expectations. I'm going to sound biased every time I talk about Dest, but if Barca had a man in the match, it would have been Messi, Fati, Neto, or Dest, one of the four. He was hung out to drive by his teammates when they had him talk to the media post game, but that tells you what poise this kid has. You ask a neutral who you think would have been better, the combo of Pedri and Dest, or the combo of Vinicius Jr. and Ferland Mendy? Pedri and Mendy was about equal, but Dest did not allow Vinicius Jr. to use that flank. The Brazilian's only success came when he attacked through the middle. As for the offensive side of the ball, I love that these teenagers don't rely on giving the ball to Messi and create for themselves. There is shine on youth, sure, but there is nothing to indicate that Coleman made the wrong choice with these starters. That said, let's talk the one starter that didn't come out firing and will lead to more discussion by Frances and I on the podcast this week. 
Sergio Busquets was rough. Frankie de Jong was still missing some long balls and hesitating too much, but his build-up play and defensive positioning were good the whole match. Busquets, though, gave the ball away. I mean, right to the feet of a white shirt, enough times to get Barca in trouble. When he never loses the ball and serves as a safety valve for the offense, there is no replacing him. But when he gives the ball up before it gets there, then he's out of position and Barca are on the back foot. It's tough to see a match like this from him because he's had enough of a drop-off in the last two seasons when there are legitimate questions about whether or not this is fixable or if we're just watching the twilight of a legend's career. Luckily for Busi, Neto came up big time and time again in this match, and it could have been worse for Barca if not for him. It's odd to me that the two opposing ideas can be true, that Neto had some great saves in both halves and was arguably Barca's best player, while I also would have preferred Ter Stegen because he's Neto but better at everything. Still, he was an expensive player, remember that swap with Sillison, and thankfully he's playing like his price tag. Alright, let's fly through the bad parts now. With the team's trading blows to start the second half, it's awful that this game was decided the way it was, with a silly shirt tugged by Clement Lenglet and a simultaneous dive by Sergio Ramos. Yes, it was a penalty. Real Betis didn't get the same call last week, and the Liga should answer for some inconsistency. But by the letter of the law, both of these occasions were penalties. But the fact that it's Ramos makes it harder to swallow, the way he dove the opposite way of the pole. Then the bearded villain slotted under Neto and scored Real Madrid's first penalty at the Camp Nou in the Liga since, you guessed it, Van Nistelrooy in 2007. Now is not the time, but I think a long discussion about Lenglet is coming. His game has improved in some areas, but the regression in other areas is troubling. Quick note, Barca's first corner came the 67th minute after Madrid had already had a half dozen. Barca's goals don't come from corners, they never have, but it stinks that something that is supposed to be an advantage will never be one. That said, the advanced metrics do back up that risking it on corners isn't worth it, with the percentage of scoring actually lower across the top 5 leagues than your opponent getting out on the counterattack. After the penalty was when Zidane put Coleman to bed. Coleman's decision to not only wait on subs, but then put in Griezmann, Brathwaite, Dembele, and Trincao while keeping on Coutinho and Messi is pure desperation and made the third Madrid goal inevitable. Only one player can realistically touch the ball at one time, so putting in so many attackers was more reckless than intuitive. Did you really think a midfield three of De Jong, Coutinho, and Messi, both of which were completely gassed, were going to cut out a counterattack? It was all or nothing for Barcelona, and I don't really blame any of the players who came on late for the way the game ended, even though Griezmann did have one touch, and that's not a good look. Chaos is good when you let it out of the bottle, but this was poured all over the table. So the third goal from Madrid came precisely because Barca were exposed at the back, but what else do you expect with six forwards on the field? Luka Modric came off the bench and looked fresh, Coutinho and Messi never tracked back, and Neto got caught out. A bummer that it felt like it happened in slow motion. With the win, Madrid took the lead in El Clasico's, 97 wins to 96, and 52 draws in 245 official matches. More concerning, while Messi was involved and had a lot of bright moments, he's still adapting to a new system, and his numbers indicate that. On top of that, it's now been six straight duels with Real Madrid since he last scored. So there were positives from this one, particularly for the future. But the worry comes from the present, and losing, and the emotional burden of losing to Real Madrid. This is a team and a manager that got a passing grade against Sevilla in their first test, a failing grade against Adafi in their second test, and now another failing grade in their third real test of the season, and we're only six matches in. With the noise of everything happening behind the scenes, this is a team until at least January, so they have to get something figured out. Francesca and I will try to figure some of those things out on this week's pod, so look out for that wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, Forza Barca!